My name's Graham Hunt. I'm co-convener of the Renew Sydney Central branch. And on behalf of all the branch committee, it's, it's good to see you all joining in. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on, on which the Sydney Central branch operates and where I am at the moment, which is the land of the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation. We acknowledge and pay our respect to their past, present and future traditional custodians and elders. And we also acknowledge their sustainable stewardship of the First Nations people across the whole country over many millennia. Please feel free to let us know where you're joining in from by dropping your a note into the chat box. For those of you new to Review, just a few words about us. Since 1980, Renew has been inspiring, guiding and helping people to become more sustainable. We have branches and members all over Australia. We welcome you to become a member. If you want to know more about renewable energy, how to make your home more sustainable to live in, or if you're looking at renovating or building a new home, then Renew is for you. You could be a professional working in the housing industry and want to know more and find some practical, sustainable solutions. Renew is a source of extensive knowledge. It also has a great interactive community of like-minded people who thrive on sharing their experiences. It has leading magazines such as Sanctuary and Renew and our flagship event, Sustainable House Day, occurs in September each year. There are various options for membership. So to become a member or find out more, go to the link which is being dropped into the chat box now. While I'm there, I'd like to make an announcement about an upcoming event on the 7th of March, 7th of April, sorry, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. We are excited to announce we'll be having a webinar with a presentation by Michael Lee. Research and Analysis Manager at, from Climate Work Center on the changes to the housing regulations in the National Construction Code 2022, which is dealing with the energy efficiency requirements, where a long awaited significant increase in stringency is proposed. So keep an eye on your emails for details about that. Tonight, though, we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Veena Sahad Jawala from Uni of New South Wales Sustainable Materials Research and Technology Centre, SMART for short. You will know Professor Veena as the New South Wales Australian of the Year for 2022, and will possibly have seen her on TV or in the media. Veena will be assisted by Anna Ban Ghosh, head of the micro factories unit at Smart Centre at the Uni of New South Wales. They will be discussing how problem waste can be reformed into valuable products such as ceramics for fitting out of buildings using the micro factory process. If you have any techni technical issues during the evening, please use the chat function to get assistance. If you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A button and not the chat box. We will go through questions at the end of the presentation. It is normal that we get more questions than we'll have time for, so please be patient. We'll be recording the presentation and that should be available on the Renew YouTube channel in a few days. Once it has been uploaded, an email will the, with the link will be sent to all participants. On Thursday evening, we, at the generosity of Mervac, we hosted a tour of an apartment at Sydney Olympic Park where the ceramics have been installed as wall and floor tiling and as part of furniture and fittings. They look very stylish and impressive. So now we ask Fina and, and a band to tell us about the process of how they are made. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Graham and uh, Marissa, for the opportunity to speak here this evening. 
Uh, my colleague Ganevar and I are absolutely privileged and, and thrilled uh, to join you all. Um, I wanted to, of course, uh, begin uh, also by acknowledging uh, the uh, traditional owners, um, that's the Gadigal people whose land we come from, uh, of the era nation, and um, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and uh, talk about um, why it's so important for us to care for our land, care for our country, and of course, um, a part of our work today is really to tell you a little bit about um, the work we've been doing with green ceramics and how we've in fact shown that it is absolutely possible to take uh, waste resources um, and uh, waste resources that are in this particular instance, when we talk about our waste uh, glass, uh, waste textiles, uh, and of course, many other kinds of materials we have chance to share a bit about uh, that uh, as well tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you a bit about what we've been doing with waste plastics and using that um, for uh, 3D printing. But all in all, really to give you a broader flavor of why it matters, why is it so important? Uh, we know, of course, that um, we've got significant quantities of waste resources. Our materials, uh, whether they are our glass, metals, uh, plastics, all of these are resources uh, into which, of course, energy has gone in. Uh, um, and um, that means in making of these products in the first life. Um, we know, of course, very well that uh, all of that um, energy that went in, um, these materials are effectively like these micro bundles of energy. Um, so therefore, you know, you can't simply assume that after one life, um, whether it's our, our glass and, and other materials that uh, we're going to uh, be able to just simply throw it away. If we start to look at all of these at the micro level, these materials can be reformed and brought back to life. So really we'll give you a little bit of flavor about what we mean by reform, uh, taking, taking that whole sort of notion of three hours of reduce, reuse, recycle and going beyond uh, that and talking about reform uh, is, is what we'll share with you in, in our journey and why it matters. But also the important point about collaboration, because again, in all of these waste resources, it's not just about you know, the journey of waste when it starts its life of when we put it into our yellow bins and the council then takes it away. And then, you know, we've kind of said, well, it's out of our hands now, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, as we all know, that is not necessarily um, a very collaborative approach, but if we can imagine the whole of sort of circular way we think about solutions from an engineering perspective and thinking holistically about materials have to, of course, do the job. So just because something is recycled, um, it doesn't mean that you've got to compromise on standards. So we have to be able to, of course, show that any engineered products we make, we have to check whether it meets uh, the requirements in terms of standards. And, and um, certainly it's about ultimately creating products and solutions that are fit for purpose. That's really where, of course, the question becomes, you know, really is waste material a waste that simply needs to be thrown away and, and seen as somebody else's problem? Or what we are really asking here is if it can be engineered and re-engineered and remanufactured and, and created into a fit for purpose product, we can actually bring a lot of our materials and products back to life over and over again in different forms. And this is where, of course, reform comes in. Um, I think the best example you can think of when you think about electronic devices, you know very well that designs, whether they are of our mobile phones, computers, and others, will keep changing, will keep evolving, technology will evolve. That doesn't mean that metals that are used, for example, to make our circuit boards like copper and tin are no longer useful just because they happen to be in an, in an old obsolete device. So think of it this way, you know, your device might change, the design and its functionality will change, but a lot of the fundamental building blocks in this particular case we're talking about in a phone on a circuit board, metals like copper and tin, those types of uh, metals can be brought back to life uh, many, many times. And of course, with many materials like metals, uh, they are, of course, capable of being recycled. And why is it important um, to, of course, back to that point about energy? It takes a lot of energy to produce our metals, whether it's aluminium, copper, steel, and so on. So we think about decarbonization and ultimately showing that the world can actually do a lot in the space. We have to make sure that every bit of metal, every bit of ceramic and polymer is captured and reform back into its next life, which means the critical piece from input to output is how we actually show manufacturing taking place. So this is where, of course, our micro factories 
uh, come in. And indeed, at this point, I just wanted to pause for one moment uh, and introduce head of our micro factories. Anuban um, has been doing a fantastic job in imagining what a whole new future of uh, micro factories might look like. So it's not just in the context of recycling, but rather thinking about why micro factories and the fact that we can take resources, we can actually create uh, products that have never before been manufactured. So um, I'm going to uh, hand over to Anuban, but also kind of slightly embarrass him by saying he's he's actually been the absolute genius who's made all of this thing work and come to life. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Um, I think I <laughs> and, uh, and on that note, Anuban, <laughs> it's over to you. <laughs> it was too far, but no, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you again to Marissa and the Renew Group for the opportunity. But um, and thank you for also the feedback on when the fact that when you saw the apartment that it's uh, something that's uh, that people have been excited about and that it's uh, to Vina's point that when you're trying to make um, products from waste materials there's this assumption that uh, or I, I guess we come with that assumption that does it really meet uh, high quality does it really meet that aesthetic uh, quality and as engineers um, I think there was always a belief um, if I can say this and that's something that and I mean, I, I guess I get to embarrass you equally here and that <laughs> always inspired us that materials are always resources and that they can be transformed um, at, a, at a molecular level into these new products that can function and meet Australian standards. And you can create fantastic things like um, 3D printing filaments to tiles and all the things that we've kind of made, but also to meet that aesthetic quality, which I think in this um, instance with green ceramics was quite a, quite a challenge for us because uh, when you start getting feedback from uh, where it's not a not necessarily a number or, or a or a spectra on a, on a on a plot or an analysis, and to be getting a bit of that feedback, like I think you know, if I don't if I if I remember correctly, it was um, uh, tiles are too warm or uh, tiles are too yeah. cold. <laughs> thinking, what, what exactly does that mean from a, from a waste perspective to transform yes. it? But to see that now in um, in an install in uh, like the apartment and now it's in Olympic Park and a few of these other installs and a few more hopefully to come this year that we are really excited to be able to um, also talk about in the next uh, over the course of this year and and to show um, I, I think that's been one of the really exciting parts of taking that science all the way to um, a commercial reality which. Um, I, I dare say is something you know, that you've made is quite unique at SMART and we're lucky enough here to have that opportunity to go right from uh, fundamental science all the way to um, not only imagining the solutions, but realizing or realizing them in places like Kudamundra and Nara and having industry partners, then I'm sure there'll be questions about, um, or, or I, I hope there are questions about, well, where can I get some of these products? And <laughs> now we have industry partners who can uh, hopefully fulfill that. For you so to have them as well as part of that uh, journey is really important but you know i might hand it back to you the uh Pearl. awesome thank you thanks Saniban. and i'm going to just share start sharing slides here uh just i guess um from our perspective to take you through a little bit of the scientific journey that we've been embarking upon as Anuban was alluding to. So what we do at the Smart Center of course is uh, to be able to take it all the way from those uh, fundamental scientific concepts and really um, I do want to acknowledge that without the support that we get from of course government grants to do the basic science uh, none of this um, would actually uh, become reality in all of these cases understanding the fundamentals of materials um, understanding of course how these technologies can be deployed uh, so we'll give you a bit of that flavor as well as we go through um, so part of what we do um, in, in terms of our work at the smart centers bringing together that whole sort of um, you know, circularity to life, we need to bring together recycling, manufacturing, and ultimately getting to that product end of it. And of course, looking at it holistically, why does this matter? It matters because of course, uh, if we don't do it, then um, you know, waste will end up in landfill. Um, and from our perspective, we, as we've talked about, it's a valuable resource. So why can't we use this 
to create new jobs. And we'll talk about what kind of job opportunities where micro factories, once they start to get deployed, um, it's a great way for regional communities to actually be empowered in terms of creating those new manufacturing jobs. Um, and of course, whether we're talking about, as we said, processing plastics or glass or metals from waste, in all of these cases, it's about developing solutions uh, that are fit for purpose. And, you know, we all assume, oh, well, all metals are recyclable, you know, all steel, all aluminium, everything. Uh, so what's the problem? You know, but that's not quite the case. I mean, to give you one simple example, when we've looked at packaging materials, uh, which have got aluminium, uh, whether they are present in our um, sort of packaging related to food or whether it is uh, so many other materials that we're used to seeing, um, you know, that laminated structure where you might have a polymer and an aluminium. Of course, these are some of the more complex forms of metals. So when we actually are talking about decarbonization and how the world needs to value every bit of metal, um, we do know, of course, metals are recyclable, but it's about how you capture that and bring it into manufacturing. It's not just about saying, well, why don't we set up one grand big smelter and, and all our problems will be solved. We know very well that scalability, both up and down uh, the scale is important. So if you wanna be able to set up small processing units so we don't have to transport waste over long distances. This is where of course, uh, helping uh, and using micro recycling uh, can be an important part. So as I was saying earlier, in terms of the circularity, what we are looking at here is the opportunity to look at how waste connects with design, production, manufacturing, but then the important part in completing that circle is very much about who are the end users? Well, I mean, we're the end users, right? Whether we're, uh, whether we're buying it for our homes or offices, uh, you know, regardless of where we work in, in retail and in construction. So ultimately all of these materials can be brought back to life in the form of products that are fit for purpose. Uh, so just as a little bit of a backdrop in terms of the vision at Smart Center is very much about transformation of waste. We want to actually start to think about um, this kind of materials revolution where we're really saying, actually, we'd never really given a second thought to our waste because we just always under, underestimated the potential. Uh, and, and I guess uh, what we can share with you in many instances is that it's always been a journey of discovery for us. You know, our examples of green steel and other such um, um, solutions where we've used things like waste tires in the production of steel, for instance. And we've shown that, of course, uh, these types of processes are actually performing even better in some cases. The reason why, of course, that happens is the way manufacturing process can take advantage of things like waste tires in the case of green steel. And much in the same way as we'll tell you a bit about the journey of where indeed our waste glass and indeed textiles can serve a purpose. And in this case, um, I'll uh, Pause for a moment, uh, let Anibhan kind of tell, tell you a little bit about some of the industry partners we're working with, um, and uh, not just, of course, Mervac, and you've seen, uh, seen some of that uh, example, uh, but let's begin by telling you a bit about, um, I guess, uh, green ceramics, and then we'll talk about some of the other filaments as well. So I'll pause there, and Anibhan, hand it uh, back to you. Sure. Um... Yeah, this one, uh, this this table, I, I know a uh, graphic that we've been kind of developing over many years, and it's kind of naturally happened. I think that, um, and as with many things, it was one of those um, moments of, I guess, high pressure that created one of these uh, bits of, um, I kind of really understand uh, how does everyone kind of fit into that supply chain? Or, or for us now, we, we kind of call it a material supply network, because we really see as everyone uh, plays a role uh, in that in that supply chain and it could be that it's that you're creating a product which is then a feedstock for someone down that uh, down the chain and to enable all of that to happen but to have those core uh, waste uh, materials in the middle where we've got people like Tez and Mollycop and um, Textile Recyclers Australia and um, Kandui Technologies who are um, either who, who are real problem owners in this respect where they're the ones who are having to uh, that currently are taking our waste materials and then are aggregating them or doing some level of disassembly. But in our minds, it's really about how do they transform from being simply recyclers or um, waste aggregators into manufacturers. And that's when it gets really powerful because when they start thinking of themselves as manufacturers and as part of a manufacturing supply chain, that's when the entire product ecosystem that you can see that we've tried to uh, show in blue around it where they're the people who are the, the end users of that material um, can 
can um, can really transform them into a into a new product or into a new service. And on that, and I guess we, I, it just occurred to me that it, it, it's really those transition points between the the brown and the blue areas. That's where the micro factories sit. On being able to connect the sphere of uh, let's say specialty waste or e waste and and Tez to someone like Umec, um, that's it, it's not a trivial connection where Tez doesn't have the facility necessarily to um, create uh, feedstocks out of their um, at, at some of their plastics or metals and put them into um, into a manufacturer and into an engineer. And that's where the micro factories are really about taking um, a variety of different kinds of waste materials and transforming that into a consistent product that you're then able to, um, that's of a high value. It has economics underpinning it. It also has a lot of the testing uh, that needs to go into it so that you're making um, products always off that meet a consistent standard. But you know, before I delve, I know too deeply into micro factories because I'm sure I can go on about it for a while. <laughs> no, thanks, Anavan. That's great. And I guess, I mean, from our point of view, that's really what we wanted to also talk about. But but I think in a way, just if we were to hone in on one particular waste, of course, in this case, we're talking about waste glass. And you know, on one hand, of course, we, we've got plenty of waste glass, right? And of course, textiles. But on the other hand, if we actually start to consider and stop and pause and reflect on what's happened during COVID times and how you know, our supply chains of important products like tiles um, has been disrupted, of course. Um, so then you have to stop and ask, well, wait a minute. So if we were to actually bolster our sovereign capability, and if we were to manufacture, um, you know, our ceramic, in this case, our green ceramic products from waste, there's no shortage of waste glass and textiles in Australia, right? So so it's, it's almost like this opposite end of the spectrum, but plenty of stockpiles of our waste. Um, we've got technology. And on the other hand, we've got a lot of our traditional products that we've been we've become used to importing from overseas. Um, and those supply chains, of course, have been disrupted in a big way. So part of what we are really talking about here is almost sort of taking this moment, if, if there's something that you know, we are learning through what the world has gone through this major disruption over the last couple of years, is you know, can we actually now start to convert that into a positive? It's sometimes hard to imagine, hard to see positives when there are so many uh, sort of difficulties that people uh, in the world and including, of course, in Australia are facing with floods. But I think in all of this, the question does lie, in this case, the connectivity to be able to bring a lot of these products to life through the capabilities and capacities that we have um, right here in Australia in the manufacture and production of green ceramics, um, you know, starts to show that uh, we do have the capacity, we do have the resources to manufacture these kinds of uh, products. So I'll come to them in a moment and show you a few pictures. Um, but of course, if we reflect on similarly waste textiles, uh, you know, similar sort of problem. We know we've got lots of waste textiles. We know they probably end up in landfill uh, or get incinerated. And if we can actually start to see the value, except you might say, well, what do you know, soft materials like textiles and hard glass have in common. And in this particular case, that's exactly what we have, uh, you know, discovered and shown that you can have two very different materials coming together in, in a brand new form. And this is what we call our reform. Um, so moving on to that next slide to show you a picture from that apartment and really explain I'll hand back to Anibun to explain what you're seeing in that picture there. But that's really what reform is about. You can see our green ceramics in there being used, the combination of glass and textiles um, coming to life in a whole new product format uh, shows that really sky's the limit. The underpinning science and technology and manufacturing um, will actually uh, need to be established, will need to be understood so we can create ultimately high quality products. And that's really the game changer. We wanna shift the mindset from thinking that waste is just a low quality you know, material to actually saying, if you've got the feedstock right, if you've got the manufacturing right, you can actually create high quality products. Um, so I'll hand back to Anibhan to talk a little bit about uh, this apartment. I, I, yeah, and I, mean, I, I think to that point as well, um, if I can, uh, is a, I guess the anecdote of like how this actually came about in that, um, like the question I'm sure will come up as to, uh, you know, why glass and textile? Why, um, as you're mentioning the soft and the hard and, you know, what, why do they suddenly combine? And um, it, again, it's like, I, I, the reason I like telling the story simply is because it, um, 
kind of gives a little bit of insight as to not everything is really well planned and that it all um, happens, some of it happens just by pure experimentation and by um, mm -hmm. trialing these, uh, but also struggling with the problems that uh, when we initially, um, a couple of years back when uh, we had, I think you were, had one of your PhD students um, in, in your office and you were kind of going through some of the challenges that um, they were facing with uh, their product of recycling um, or trying to find solutions for waste glass. And um, it all sounds like, well, waste glass, you know, should be recyclable. You put it in a glass filter and you can, you can recycle waste glass. But this was where things get, again, get exciting for us, but probably um, we sh shouldn't get too excited about it. And that the more problematic a waste material, the, uh, the more interesting it is from a scientific perspective. But things like architectural glass and windshields and the, the photo that Vina was showing earlier, where you've got polymer layers, or you've got toughened glass, you've got hardened glass, you've got tinted glass. Um, you've got glass with different chemistries. All of that um, produces complexity in that, in that ability to recycle, that if we put everything together, can it still go back to a glass smelter? And the short answer is that, well, firstly, where is your uh, local glass smelter? Um, but also some of it really can't. And that's where we needed to look at how we can create new products out of it. And simultaneously, we had, I think, another one of your students, you know, or you were, I think you were exploring areas around waste textiles and what can you do with waste textile material. And it turns out that the problems, are, as we were kind of whiteboarding it, the, the problems on both sides seem to say, well, if, maybe if we combine them, they might <laughs> they might have some have a solution there. And hence um, the the island bench face, the splashback, and even the, the pendant lights and uh, some of the other products that I'm sure a few of you had a chance to visit um, earlier or, or last week, uh, they're all, it's a system of manufacture that, you know, being engineers, um, we went for the simplest form possible where it was, uh, you, you make a tile, it's a nice square rectangular object. It's very, uh, very engineered. Um, but in reality, it's a, it's a material and it's a system of being able to make, um, I, I think uh, in this photo, you can't see it, but on the left-hand side, there's also the, the floor lamp, for instance, where it's a little bit more artistic, a bit more freeform, but just being able to provide the basics that you need, um, like your countertops, like your floor tiles and your uh, splashback, but made from, waste materials and made locally, um, I think are all of the bits that kind of get us excited about why green ceramics. Yeah, and I've actually got another one of these pictures to follow on so you can kind of hone in on, on I guess, the flooring as well and the wall. The oh, and, wall. The, and the touch of coffee. So any project that we do with me has to have a touch of coffee in it somewhere. Um, <laughs> yes, right here, I've got my cup with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, the, the wall tiles that were with the LED and uh, uh, that the Mervac design team came up with um, in terms of the uh, the aesthetics of it. For us, the exciting part of the design challenge was how do you create this um, honestly very demanding texture that they wanted. Um, that so they gave us a, an image of a marble and said, "Well, can you can you create something that's similar that has these nice soft tones, but um, is made from waste materials?" And um, in our well, in our local micro factory, I guess, which is in our basement, um, which, so at this point, it's actually 30 minutes uh, down the stairs because our lifts are um, flooded, but uh, normally it's only a few minutes down. And we actually had to experiment and to come up with ways of um, creating this. And it was uh, the jute bags that um, coffee is transported in is what we actually use to try and create that texture from a material perspective and still maintain that sustainability and maintain that, um, and that engineered quality that, it's still stain resistant, it's still durable. It doesn't, like if you drop the tile, it doesn't shatter on like a lot of other ceramic tiles. So you can see here, you've got uh, a few more uh, products that we've made um, in our micro factories. Um, of course, uh, to put into context, this is what it looks like, um, you know, in terms of whether it's a, a decorative walling feature or indeed whether it is, um, you know, the, the feature table, you can see that beautiful table as well. Uh, but also, you know, to be able to show you that that feature wall that we were talking about made from jute bags. Uh, and you can see our basement um, micro factory that I was referring to, uh, the basement micro factory. You can see team members working away. And uh, and of course, there's Anuban as well in his blue shirt. So I think I'll uh, probably, um, you know, just uh, in the interest of time, uh, come to uh, start to wrap up the talk. 
uh, what we are really saying is with micro factories, we are actually showing that these technologies really are about ultimately, uh, yes, recycling. Yes, it is about, um, you know, revolutionizing the way we think about recycling in the new age. It is very much about connecting it to manufacturing and having product solutions uh, that, um, you know, you can't achieve otherwise. And uh, I guess uh, there's Anuman back again, so I'll bring him back into into the next slide in a moment, just to sort of give you a bit of flavor as, as we're wrapping up towards the end with our micro factories that, yep, it is very much about, you know, decentralization, um, generating local jobs and economic benefits. But I'll hand back to Anibar and talk a little bit about, um, and we'll show you a little picture around um, what we've got going in Kudamandra. So um, uh, Anibar, I guess uh, if you wanted to just take us through um, uh, where where our thoughts are with micro factories. Yep. Uh, apologies about that. Um, no, that uh, Kuda Mandra for us has been, I, I guess, that first step for us outside of uh, the. As I, I don't know if I cut out when I was mentioning the um, our basement micro factory, but for us, Just that then, first, yeah. <laughs> well, literally went underground. But <laughs> our, our first uh, commercial micro factory outside the university um, has been Kuda Mandra, and it was, I think, again, the question why Kuda Mandra was. Uh, it's to do with people who are problem owners. And this is where um, Andrew Douglas, um, who's, and now we fondly call the Kuda fellow, even though he, I don't think has ever <laughs> lived there for longer than <laughs> lived in Kuda Mandra, but that's where his facility was for mattress recycling. And they had logistics and they had a big pile of mattress fluff, which was the problem material. And they were looking for, well, what can we make out of it? And well, green ceramics is a solution. And he's been, um, he's obviously, funded this iron it wasn't just that he rocked up one day with mattress fluff but he rocked up one day with mattress fluff i think almost 10 years back uh, <laughs> steps and we went well let's let's see what we can make out of it and um to have partners like that along the journey who not only have supported the research and that development but now are in that commercialization journey of it where um in kudamandra we've got uh, a regional factory so for for us there were challenges around when we go regional, how do you get the right jobs in that area? How do you find, um, oh, thank you, Marissa, for, yes, uh, for linking Andrew's uh, website. And for being able to get um, the right supply chains in that area to get also um, products that, honestly, every time we went down to Kudamundra, the weather down there, there's something different. Um, we've had rain like we've had in Sydney um, a couple of times. We've had searing hot uh, days where literally plastic bottles and things on the ground have uh, have softened and melted uh, we've had um, thunder lightning all of all of the usuals we've had uh, fly <laughs> issues so just having all those challenges and trying to make high quality products in in your micro factory um, have really shown us that we can that it, it can work in in a remote setting and and having uh, just delivered uh, some of these tiles, which I think I might have one here. Which, so th these these are the kind of the latest um, uh, tile that I, actually I don't know if I can you can see that. So that's this green tile that was made down, and so it's um, it's got a few features at the back as well to assist with all the fixings and adhesives. But uh, this was made down in Kudamundra, where we've just made another 50 square meters to go into Sydney Olympic Park's uh, swimming pool change room walls. So things like that to see that they are starting up and they're at that point where uh, we're now starting to scale up which is also that really exciting part of the journey where um, for micro factories the scale really is it doesn't mean that the machinery as it gets a lot bigger it means that there are multiple modules that are then able to make multiple uh, different products and here's uh here's something that you can talk to uh Anuban in terms oh, of uh, <laughs> the uh, actual... so the person in the middle you'll probably recognize um <laughs> This was um, actually this is one of my favorite photographs. I have it actually uh, on canvas in my office because uh, this uh, this is the night before the Australian story came in and filmed the the micro factory. So I'm sure many people will probably appreciate that the factory was only working minutes before that, um, and that was treated <laughs> like the deadline to. Um, and it it was I think in the I think it was Jennifer who filmed uh, you turning it on for the first time as yes, well. That's right. Mm. Um, mm. So to to have all of that where you've got some of that automation to be able to produce the products, but it is also those, the people which 
Um, now, in this case, it is it is people that were actually students, at, uh, or one of them was an ex-student and has since uh, migrated out of the uni. So that, um, and you can probably guess who that is, and it isn't uh, Keith, who's on the far left, <laughs> who migrated out of the uni many, many years ago, but he's our mentor. <laughs> uh, so has you know, 50 years of manufacturing experience. So to have um, from the young to the old who can all, uh, play a role in not only the development of micro factories, but then uh, set up these regional centers that can hopefully uh, be a piece in that puzzle for our waste recycling uh, and manufacturing supply chains. Yeah, and this was probably uh, one of those things where we, um, you know, were of course quite nervous because it's the first time through that physical sciences funding opportunity to go from what we have in our basement uh, to take it out into, uh, you know, that facility out at Kudamandra uh, to get it up and running, uh, I guess, is is a really important sort of point. And, and I guess uh, the next, uh, watch the space for what's coming uh, during the course of 2022. Um, but, but I guess, I mean, um, just to be able to wrap up, you know, what we are really talking about here in terms of supply chains and what I mentioned earlier, you know, you can work within that conventional thinking of you make something, you use it and dispose of, or you can then move into the more circular uh, solutions that we've been talking about. And circularity is not just about, you know, hey, we need to recycle. It can be everything from reusing, repairing, you know, you recover, you recycle. And then, of course, we talked about that uh, fourth hour of reform. Uh, so, but in all of this case, it, it of course requires us to, to literally go back to the drawing board in terms of micro factories, as we've uh, heard uh, today. And um, uh, the, the last photo I want to put up, of course, Sanibhan, is uh, for you to talk to uh, this particular micro factory, which has been again, uh, you know, a creation that uh, keeps on giving, right? I mean, it's sort of grown from literally an empty room. <laughs> yeah, so it's all, was, over to you. <laughs> this this was, um, I guess, very special, for, like for all of us, because uh, this was our first um, micro factory at the university on level four. So it is down the hall, so we get to see it regularly. Um, but uh, it's it's our e-waste micro factory and. Um, I, I guess you know, I can embarrass again you here a little bit before um, <laughs> oh, no. I, I think they cut me off but um, it was trying to convince people um, I think at that time uh, that manufacturing and not only should use waste materials but uh, should have little uh, drones flying around in a room to uh, robotic arms and, and that it was necessary um, not just that you needed it but you had little uh, robotic uh, bins as well, and uh, that we were going to make filaments and alloys in a space that was less than 50 square meters. Uh, I, I think took a, a lot of courage <laughs> to, to put it out there. And, um, and the space has continued to evolve with us, where now it's the home of our uh, 3D printing uh, little farm, where we've got 25 printers ready to, well, that have just printed an artwork for the Biennale of Sydney. So if you are down there, you can maybe spot which artwork was made but also having uh this ability to do that high temperature work and then really tackle those alloys and those critical materials that are present in in e-waste and um being able to make those um those filaments that we've used in some of our 3d printed products but it's yeah uh i i might leave it there i don't know if this time you've lost your camera you know, uh, oh. or not your uh, <laughs> well, look, uh, I think we're probably well and truly past time, so yeah. I'm going <laughs> to just uh, stop sharing there and, um, uh, you know, say thanks, um, I guess, to, to both Marissa and Graham for uh, the invitation to speak and to present uh, this session on, on our micro factories. Um, and, and happy to, I guess, hand it back to you, Graham. Um, thank you so much for um, uh, the opportunity to share a little bit of our journey as you can probably tell we could probably keep everyone busy here for hours and hours telling you about about our journey and all the all the fun things we do in our micro factories but uh in the interest yeah. of time we'll leave it at that grant thank you okay okay thank you very much Vina and anna ben um look i it's really exciting i think to to hear about something that's small scale easily replicable for regional areas, um, you know, that the potential for that is huge. Um, we have a few questions, but before going to that, I'd like to just comment on visiting the apartment the other day. And you're talking about having to produce high quality 
materials. I was impressed to see that there weren't any that what weren't only that they were also something different, hmm. something unique, like the marble like tiles because they had the fabric component in them actually gives them a a, a unique new texture um and similar with the light fittings you know having the diffuse slice coming through glass particles so i think that's the exciting part of it it's not just having something that's going to match what's already there there's potential to produce new opportunity or new materials that are maybe pushing the boundary further um, that was my impression from seeing what I saw. Oh, um, thanks, Pam. No, we really appreciate that feedback because yeah. I think I think you've absolutely summed up, um, you know, really the potential that we have here yeah. in looking at recycled materials as uh, really offering some unique features, uh, and that's that's really where science, technology, design, all of that comes together. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for those kind words. Okay, good. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, the first one is asking, where can we touch, see and touch products? And from someone who's renovating a home in Canberra, I don't know if they should drive down to Cootamundra or if that's too premature. Um, but yeah, is it in the opportunity? Oh, look, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know, Anivan, do you think we want to talk about, we do have... Uh, it can go to Nauru. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and in terms of seeing a product, I suppose, I mean, you know, going and having a look at, uh, we, I think we did the Academy office or the kitchenette. The Atsi had, uh, had yeah, a, that, a, a that was in, uh, that's in Canberra. Yeah, the, the yep. splash pack that we put in there last year. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But if people are interested, Graham, in that space as well, um, and if they want to reach out, as I, I think I mentioned mm. Marissa as well, we'll, um, we can, at the university, we, of course, we can have um, we have mm. a few samples here, but we uh, Andrew was able to send out a few samples to them um, to be able to touch, feel, see, match, um, uh, and yep. or just keep. <laughs> okay, that's that's great. Um, we have a question. Sorry, I'm just having a um, question from Sylvia. Um, have there been any durability studies done? Do green ceramic scratch chip break more easily than normal ceramics? I'm so glad you asked that question, Graham, because this is exactly the sort of stuff, as you can imagine, uh, you know, with Anubhan and I as engineers, you know, for us, that's absolutely, you know, an important question. You know, we would yeah. not be putting products out into, into the hands of end users and real world um, if it doesn't meet standards. And that's the absolute fundamentals that um, it's got to perform. Uh, it's got to meet the standards and, and the requirements. And I'll hand over to Anirban to talk about a lot of the testing. And we do spend a lot of time and effort on that as well. But yeah, yeah over to look, you. So, um, again, there's, I think there's two parts to this uh, question, which, uh, Graham, when uh, you have, um, I, of course, we do a lot of scientific testing and we get that externally accredited as well through NADA labs for uh, for slip, stain, um, fire, combustion, all, all of those tests. And I, I think, though, for me, one of the times that I've really seen that real impact um, on, a, on a person who's actually installing this uh, tile in the Sydney Olympic Park when um, simply uh, handed them tiles and, you know, they, they initially start off and, um, I, I, and Andrew's handed them the tiles and they're a bit like, oh, really? Oh, you made this out of waste glass and textile. Oh, that's, okay, that's cool, whatever. Um, but will it, will it work? Like, are you sure you can like actually put this in a, in a building? Like, have you done, of course, the tests and um, all that, but then he picked up the tile and he dropped it and the tile simply bounced, didn't chip, didn't break, didn't shatter. And at that point, I, I think it was when he just went, whoa, he went from being uh, none of the other tiles in our, in, in our repertoire at this point that we're installing would be able to do that. If you drop any tile, it will shatter and went from literally going from how do I install this to or why would I install this to going where do I invest so I think that's where <laughs> being able to engineer it and also to see that we're able to make something that's fit for purpose where you're really trying to target it for those different applications and I think that's where that testing and all of that context of that material is also so important sorry, sorry Graham, Graham. Yeah. yeah yeah sorry that, that's great to hear um, question from Wendy is how do the products scale up for demand? Also, how to get other suppliers on board to create a 
a trend, I guess. You know, prices will, will become more affordable the more you can produce. And do you want to sort of take that? The first part of that. Um, sorry, is, was that about how do we generate demand for the... Well, how, you know, how do, can we scale up for demand, I guess? Oh, scale up. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Okay. So that's yeah. where um, we've got, uh, at this point, we are in that scale up journey. So it's something that we're um, literally doing as, as we speak. So part of it is um, increasing the production throughput. And that's the bit that I think everyone goes, well, yes, we need to make more um, to be able to sell more. Um, but for us, it's not necessarily just making more, it's making more the right way. And part of that is, yes, we want to be able to make it in different locations with decentralize that manufacturing so that it's still solving the waste problem. Um, it's not just generating more product for the sake of more product. Um, it's generating it in areas where it'll have impact. So that's why our next micro factory um, has been funded with Shoalhaven. It's down in, in now and um, to be able to create something that's near, near a tip um, it's using their waste glass, their waste textiles from that community to make products again for that community. Um, so part of that, that scale up question is in that it is modular, it's able to be uh, replicated as I think you also mentioned in, in these regional centers. And the take up and the, the, sub, the actual end market there, it, it's already there. And I think um, being able to um, take on a few of those projects that we're doing this year that really tick those boxes in um, bringing on uh, clients that are uh, able to be the the champions uh, to take that technology forward so that then we are all able to participate in it. Um, and also from an engineering point of view, to be able to solve those challenges and create products that are, of, are still of a high quality and we keep improving it. There's that continuous development that's happening with, as our waste materials change, um, the product and the technology also evolves. Okay, thank you. Um, now, question from Robert, um, reflecting on all the waste that's been generated with all the recent floods, how, how much of that volume could be micro factory input? I imagine contamination is probably an issue to deal with in, of your feedstock, I guess, for the, if you could access it. Yeah, but on that point, Graham, I mean, one of the things I, I do want to say that, you know, the green ceramics products that we've shown you today is only yeah. one, one example, right? But when you brought in it out and said, well, what else could you transform? Remember, we're talking about transforming our uh, different kinds of feedstock materials into another product so that there is value in those waste materials. So if you were, for example, looking at, yes, creating products, for you know, relatively sort of modest temperature kind of applications, which is what green ceramics are all about. And then you can go all the way to that point where we might be looking at creating at the fundamental molecular level, um, what else can you produce? For example, in many cases, we are looking to produce things like biocarbon. Um, now, if you were doing that out of you know, materials that might have uh, you know, not just the carbon part in the mixture, of course. I mean, when you talk about waste wood, um, you know, and many other waste polymeric materials, they are rich in carbon. Uh, but on the other hand, it's about how that complex mixture, because you're absolutely right, by the time you've got complex mixtures, it's not necessarily a stream that is, you know, just glass or just textiles or just wood. Uh, unfortunately, in the cleanup effort, you know, we do and we do expect um, to see that there could well be mixture. So part of what micro factories are designed to do, as we were saying before, they are modular in nature. Uh, you really have to look at the form in which your feedstock is coming in. And then of course, meeting the requirements of what that transformation journey will be based on the input qualities and properties, then to say, okay, well, it could then be converted into uh, some other materials which require a different temperature for transformation. And the reason why you would do that is your micro factory will then respond to the input feedstock. And, and that's important to recognize because you're absolutely right. I mean, in, even in, you look at something like our e-waste that we were talking about before, right? We do know that it's a combination of metals and polymers. You know, it's not as if it's a straightforward metal and you put it into a smelter. So part of the transformation is recognizing that selectively you can convert different kinds of resources, waste resources in this case, into value added materials. But again, they've got to be produced at the right setting in a micro factory. So absolutely what we haven't spent time talking about today is 
you know, what are some of the other, other products? I mean, a lot of times there's a lot of metal that um, gets thrown out. So I'd say if, if there is a lot of metallic waste, that also is very valuable as, as one might expect. So I think really kind of, you know, hopefully looking at how we can, how we can do something with those resources uh, may well be helpful in the long term in communities rebuilding efforts, which I think would be really good to see. Is there ever a possibility you could have a portable micro factory that could go to disaster areas or not? Yeah, look, I mean, very good question. I'll hand over to anybody because it's it's been something that's been uh, part of our conversation and thinking, um, yeah. you know, for a long, long time. Uh, Anuban, do you want to comment on, you know, how we see that um, happen, um, you know? Um, it, absolutely, Graham. And I think that's where, um, I, I guess part of that assumption that, okay, it's a portable micro factory that you're able to uh, move it to a location and that the one caveat I would, put into that is that yes the micro factory can go there but it may not be the the end solution that it's manufacturing mm -hmm. and that that supply of material and that understanding where that module fits in um, into that entire supply chain is is really important and i think that's where keeping that uh that visibility of where are you trying to take the material that you're not just creating like a, a bag of baled plastic for instance yes it may be sorted but what what then um, yeah. What after that? Um, what what happens after you've created a pellet? What happens after you've created a chip of timber? And really keeping that visibility. It may not be that that micro factory or that manufacturer takes it all the way to a product, but knowing how you're connected is, I think, how you uh, is part of our thinking of how you laterally. Uh, we have this term around of lateral integration, yeah. where you're really trying to create those networks that then can absolutely have components that are modular and that are. Uh, relocatable and that can run off solar power and that can be um, situated near hopefully uh, not too many disaster sites but yes if if it needs to be there absolutely yeah sure we need to keep it part of the circle i guess um yeah exactly and i can imagine you know this may well inspire people in the regions and the in the longer term to think about maybe there are new business opportunities um because waste is a part of our lives and whatever those modules are going to look like, if they're part of the supply chain, if we understand, I think as Anibal was explaining, if we understand what is the purpose, you know, so even if you're creating a resource from waste, what is the purpose, you know, how is it going to be part of that supply chain for manufacturing a value added product? So I think thinking about um, that, that entire material supply network so that all of these resources we create, it's no point just sorting and, and sort of saying, here's my pile of plastics when you don't necessarily have an uptake market for that. Um, so thinking along all of those lines um, would also be an important part of, of the journey. Okay. We have a question from Anne. I think she's been doing her homework. She's asking, could you please show us examples of a PETG product and ah. ABS <laughs> product? She's re been uh, referring to the PETG data sheet. Uh, absolutely, I might. I mean, I might um, let you fill in for a moment. I'll go and see if you I can. You go and find it. Absolutely, it. yeah. Look, I mean, um, what what I love about this is that when people have done their homework and for uh, for um, for us, it's really good when people ask these questions because just for everyone's benefit, we're talking about here different kinds of plastics. So PETG, one example, ABS, another one. Um, and, and I guess from the context of what we're talking about with how do we actually convert those into their next life, which is kind of back to that point we're saying about plastics, right? If you know where to direct them to what would you manufacture with it, right? So if we're talking about, um, you know, waste plastics um, as, as an example, and I wanted to um, share this um, part of the, the screen because we didn't get a chance to get to um, our, um, our plastics and what we do in terms of the remanufacturing. I wanted to uh, just show this and, and I think what we can see here, and I'll get Anuban to explain now the samples that he might have in his hands. But the reason why I want to use ABS and some of these other examples is what we are doing with these plastics is in one instance, you can go off and create plastic filaments um, and those plastic filaments can then be put into a 3D printer for 
printing different kinds of products. So when we look at what is actually possible, um, here are you know, examples of what is indeed uh, possible from the context of, you can see there, uh, it's 3D printing, you know, and it's obviously doing spectacle frames. And I think to me, all of these are good examples of, yes, it could be um, a plastic that people didn't think was recyclable, but now can be reformed by creation of plastic filaments that can then be fed into 3D printers. So uh, that, that's an example of what we've done with, uh, a, with ABS, but uh, I'll stop screen share there. And I guess, Anirban, you've probably got some examples of what we can do uh, with PETG. <laughs> yeah, with PETG. And uh, so the idea is uh, quite simply, it's to make, uh, this, is, this is the feedstock that goes into um, into a 3D printer, as many people might be aware that that's what your ink is for your 3D printers. Uh, this is made from 100% uh, recycled uh, ABS, so that's come from e-waste. Uh, similarly, from uh, for Petchi, we've got um, where I've actually got 3D printed products. Unfortunately, I don't have any of the filament here, but uh, these are some of um, you know, replacement parts. And when we're talking about disaster areas, and you've got something that's broken, let's say in your washing machine or um, even if you're not in a disaster area and you break something in your dishwasher, for instance, as uh, at Bina's house, then you'll, uh, uh, you need just a small component that needs to be replaced. You can 3D print it and, um, and drop it back in. Uh, so that's where I guess 3D printing as well as, um, and of course there are scaled up solutions for this, but that's where being able to make that feedstock from a waste resource and doing it locally, um, again, all just, it just keeps going back to that same microfactory uh, philosophy of manufacture. Okay, that's excellent. Um, Anne's also wondering, can the tiles be used in bathrooms? I guess are they water resistant? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw another question as well. I think it was similar. Can it be used in wet areas? And yeah. um, short answer is yes. Um, we've, that's where that slip testing is um, so important. Uh, we've uh, and actually, we just recently put it as we were mentioning in the change rooms in Sydney Olympic Parks, as, um, Sydney Olympic Parks change rooms as uh, wall tiles. But for flooring as well, we do have a range uh, that you can put onto the floor. Um, of course, there's a more stringent slip test required, but yes. Uh, okay, great. Well, now we're sort of close to our end of our time, but we have um, about six more questions if you're happy to keep going or... Uh, we'll try and give a quick rapid fire answers, I guess. Yeah, yeah okay, sure. Um, sorry. Um, Robin wants to know where can ordinary people drop off their waste textiles to be used in the process? All right, so we've okay. got a textile recycling partner in this space, uh, TRA, a great place, yeah. uh, port a call for um, places to drop off your, um, like if you'd like to connect with someone who's doing uh, textile recycling okay. or reuse. <laughs> And the other question is, can they these products be recycled at the end of life? Can we make the circle complete? I guess. Yes, they can. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the time, your green ceramic goes back to your micro factory and becomes more green ceramic. Okay, good. Um, Robert wants to know, we have more questions coming in as I talk. Um, <laughs> we're getting used to energy ratings. Can we have a circularity rating to indicate how well made and designed a product is so there is no waste? Uh, I guess yeah, it's like yours. an environmental product declaration, I guess. Maybe we can product. call it the, um, the, the Vena score. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, I know we're all being very cheeky and funny, but, you know, I, and this is where, of course, you know, you need a lot of that basic science. Um, yeah, of course, energy rating and all of those um, have been around for a long time. I guess in the world that we live in, we're very mindful of the fact that having a lot of that fundamental science to support thinking has to be coupled with remanufacturing as we've talked about. So really thinking, you know, circularity where ultimately the real test lies as we've talked about, are these remanufactured products fit for purpose? And, and then only can we say it passes the test. Yeah, okay, great. Um, a question from Jenny about she wants to know how many people are employed in the production of products in Kudamundra. Oh, at this point, there would be two people, I believe, uh, down in Kuda. Um, but that's something that Andrew is now operating. This is the wonderful part about it that um, I, I'm just happy that it's not me anymore um, having <laughs> to drive down four and a half hours to Kudamundra. Yeah. 
But also, I guess, interestingly, isn't it? I mean, when we start to think about jobs and the full life cycle, you know, you can start to literally go from upstream to downstream. You know, it starts with the with I guess accessing feedstock and resources. You know, the production. Then that has a ripple effect further down. You can have designers and people who want to make tiles and 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 interior designers and people who want to then take that on further and use locally available products. So you know, to me, I just sort of see this as in a way, a starting point of a whole new ripple effect, because as opposed to getting products imported into the country, uh, this is obviously going to create a lot more local jobs. Um, and the other benefit of keeping those waste um, materials away from landfill. Um, and, and so I guess to me, that's part and parcel of that holistic thinking that uh, we've been talking about. A good way to think about creating more and more new jobs downstream and upstream, collecting different kinds of input input materials. Somebody talked about waste textiles, right? So, I mean, there's there's lots of resources that we have access to. It's really thinking about how all of that then becomes part of a feedstock, um, part of that supply chain that we've talked about. And so, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a way to think about a whole new collective and collaborative economy. Okay, well, I think we might bring it to a close there. So I'd like to thank Vina and Anavan very much for their inspiring words. I mean, not just talking about the detail of what they do, but also the overall picture of how we need to really rethink, not, I won't call it waste, rethink our resources, I guess. Um, so thank you again, everyone. And um, as I mentioned, this will be um, recorded and there'll be a video available. So keep an eye out for that and our next meeting on April the 7th. So good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming.